I guess the in our in our culture, what we tend to do is think in terms of technical solutions. If someone's ill, or if there's uh, something that is inconvenient or doesn't work very well, we first seek technical solutions like medication or some sort of contraption or some way to make things more convenient. And I think that what we suffer from is a lack of looking at the possibility of human solutions first. And I think that's um, it, it's natural because the society, it's a consumeristic society, and everyone wants to sell the solutions to our problems. And so we're, we're in a sense caught up in that, uh, that maelstrom of commercialism. But I think that we have to start learning how to think in terms of, uh, of first evaluating whether is this something, is this a problem that can be solved by, it, by people or groups of people. And I think certainly a lot of the problems that children experience can be and I'm solved sounds like, a, it's like a, a superficial sort of way to think about it, but I think needs to be, need to be addressed. And we, we evolved to be individuals and to each find our own value in the tribe. And so if, if someone doesn't, um, if someone say isn't quite down the center of the alley as far as being normal in quotes, the tribes usually found some way, unless it was a, you know, real, a real outlier, to figure out some way that they could contribute and feel good and they could be accepted and be part of the organization. And you see that a lot more in small, small towns, in agricultural areas, because um, there are a lot of different types of levels of things to do. And I think more in urban industrial society, many of those people just sort of shut themselves away in a back room somewhere. You know, people that can't quite do what's expected. Um, and there's not enough flexibility in society and enough care to really reach out and try to figure out how to create an environment for them. And we're getting glimpses of that now. People are learning the value of, of those on an autistic spectrum the strengths that they have, and uh, many of the high-tech firms are starting to work in that direction, which is a wonderful thing. Um, but I think we've got to get more, we have to look more at um, subsistence cultures and agricultural societies and small towns to try to re remember what it was we evolved to be. And when we think in terms of what's the solution to our sense of alienation and depression and anxiety, um, I don't think it's just more medication and more apps. There's got to be something that is, is, is something different that I think we have and we, we're capable of giving it to each other. I think, you know, the, the most basic thing is time, right? is, is slowing down enough to where, to where you can reach a pace. And this is certainly true like in coaching and therapy, mentor, mentorship. You have to change gears from the gear of getting things done because human relationships operate at a different speed. So I think time and, and the being careful to protect the space from distraction, you know, being able to sit and maybe for hours and maybe have long periods of silence, but just being together and sort of existing in space together. So I think that's probably key as far as that, uh, that is concerned. And then, you know, the question of eye contact and sharing, and sharing stories face to face. And I was thinking of, someone was talking about uh, young boys now no longer have to figure out how to um, you know, meet a woman and attract her attention. Now you just swipe one way or another and you make a date on some app and you just meet up at a place. And it's, uh, it, you miss the, all of the awkwardness and all of the struggle and all of the learning and, and, the, and the way people connect when they both are desirous to connect, but they're both awkward or confused or shy, you know? So there's this just beautiful process that um, in, in a search for convenience, we've lost a lot of those things. And um, I guess it, it's the value of discomfort that we need to be able to um, reassert. And it goes to, with child rearing as well. We wanna save our children from any sort of stress or any sort of, um, you know, we, we, uh, we can't allow them to be bullied, we can't allow them to get a, a B on a paper or, or whatever it is, and we take away from them all of those learning experiences that would involve them f looking in the mirror and saying, what am I, you know, what am I capable of? What am I doing? Uh, do I need to work harder? Do I need to recommit myself? So it's, it really is just, it, it's, it's funny because 
as a, as a young person, all of those things seemed so trite and passe. And I was looking for the, uh, the, the, the higher intellectual endeavors and the, the technical solutions, and I wanted to learn everything about them. And the more I learned about them, the less satisfied I was with them. I, I'm very dissatisfied with the direction that psychotherapy has gone in in general. And by that I mean the sense of developing manuals and step-by-step -step solutions. And I've never, in my own experience, I've never, I've never thought that that was the way to go, to subject someone to a method or a strategy that I have. You know, unless they ask for it, that's a different, different issue. But I, I think to be, to have the patience to stay in the space. And it really, for me, it's more like performance art because I never really know what I'm gonna happen, what I'm gonna end up doing. And I've had clients very often tell me, this is not what I expected of therapy. I expected someone, you know, with a jacket and a tie and telling me what was wrong with me. And you would say something magical that would make me, that would heal me. And I've never, that's never happened in, you know, in all the years. And I think it's, it's mostly just joining with someone and becoming part of their lives. And the more I can join with them and the more I can see the world the way they see it, I think it's, a, I'm very Rogerian at heart. You know, it's, it's, it's just that notion of, 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 of being, being congruent, being authentic. I find myself in this, I don't know how um, therapeutic this is in the world, I, I think it's helpful, but I find myself becoming, you know, becoming very attached to my clients and I have a lot of affection for them. And I feel them, I feel that they're friends, even though I'm not supposed to say that. You know, that's, that's all there for me. And I guess my intuition tells me that that's important, that they feel like I, like I talked about in my lecture or in the workshop this afternoon, that being a, um, being a guide or being someone who's crazy about someone, who sees their potential and is unwavering in that belief is a really valuable contribution. And so I have, I, I think in many ways, I become a fan of my clients to whatever degree I feel that they need that. Not to fuel narcissism, but to heal the lack of attention and the lack of being cared for. You know, so I, you know, I know my clients that haven't had good fathering, and I feel like a part of the therapy is being the father that they didn't have, is celebrating their victories and their successes, and you know, being being able to tolerate their pain and their and their imperfections without rejection. So, I think that's a huge part of it. It's it's so simple you miss it. You know, being sort of a an old hippie, and you're still waiting for the revolution from the 60s. Um, I've had all of the, the typical short-sightedness when it comes to conservative positions. And there's uh, interesting studies now with, brain, with the brains of conservatives and liberals. And what they, you know, what they found is if you, if you put folks from both camps and scanners, what you find is that people who are, con who are labeled or act like conservatives, when, if you present them with an issue of immigration, for example, will have a lot of fear activation. And so their, their orientation is protectiveness. They want to build walls. They want to create boundaries. They want to exit the, the, the communal because they want to preserve and protect what they have. Right? And if you put liberals in the scanner and you ask them the same question, what gets activated are these parts of the brain in the, in the, the lower frontal areas that are involved in empathy and attachment. So when they hear about people struggling to get in the country, they don't feel threatened, they feel compassionate and curious. Right? And I guess I've always, I've always been in a compassion camp, I guess that's why people become therapists. Right? But I think I've come to an appreciation that within the gene pool, we have people that, with that tack in both directions, and that there's some kind of balance that exists in the group mind, in the group as a whole, where we need both of those impulses. And it's just we're at a weird stage now, at least in America and I think in the UK as well, where it's almost at a tipping point where the two sides seem to be equally weighted. And so we're sort of in a stalemate. Not much is moving forward, obviously, as, <laughs> as you know. But I think, I think that is something that has, has shifted and, and 
undulated, vacillated over time, depending on resources. I think the more resources there are, the more people are feeling um, solid and safe, um, the more the more compassion they can have. But now they're the, with, with technological changes in, in the states, and I suspect here as well, people feel threatened. They feel like they're going to be replaced by machines or by some, you know, they've got all these conspiracy theories of, uh, of how they're going to be replaced by other people or from other countries. And so I think that um, it's the, the, if you look at, if you zoom out from the experience of any one individual or two individuals and you think about the balance between individual needs and the, and the cultural needs, I think that what we see is there's a balance of both of these things and there's a conflict. And I think there's a conflict in both of us. We have a, we have a desire to do good and we have a desire to take for ourselves. And so that gets played out. And, I, and so I would say that the dark side, I, you know, I guess there's probably lots of ways to define dark side. But when I think of the dark side as the evil, selfish, you know, uh, the, the warmongering side of society, perhaps. I think there's a place for it, but I think it becomes unmodulated. You know, national national pride is one thing. Nationalism is a whole is a whole another thing, and and nativism it, it's um, it goes too far. But again, I think it all stems from fear. I was thinking of uh, play therapy, and I was thinking about what an unfortunate label it is in society because. And not because it's, it's not accurate and not because it isn't good, but because people see play as the opposite of work. And it's, I think it's, it makes it really difficult to convince people that many people that are uninitiated and, and uninformed that play is, play is work. Play is what children do to learn how to be adults and to learn how to contribute to the world. And if a child's been traumatized in any way or, or stressed or abandoned or has poor attachment, they need play in order to move forward in life, and the play is the work of children. So it would be interesting if we could find some other word. I don't have an idea about it, but it would be it would be really interesting to uh, to make sh to, to be careful about how it's communicated, how the message is communicated, and to and to really say you know play with an asterisk, and what does that mean? You know what does it mean to play?